please welcome Bob Bowman. Thanks, Anthony. We're going to do this one the old-fashioned way. First, I'm going to sing. <laughs> Not really. After about 30 years of work and traveling around the country and trying to learn as much as I could, I've become an expert in my field, getting people to go up and down a box of water rapidly. <laughs> and in that pursuit, I've uh, observed a lot of different things. And one of the things that you hear a lot about in sports and particularly in swimming is this concept of a champion. You know, we have a high school state champion, we have national champions, we have Pac-12 champions, world champions, Olympic champions. And really, to me, that basically means I've found that the more frequent those occur and the more of them I have, I get paid more, so that's a good thing. I guess it must be important. But when you look it up, it just means a winner of a race or competition. And that's probably the least important part of what being a champion is to me. Because one of the things I have learned in 30 years is that it's what you become in the process of pursuing those goals that's the most important thing. And having studied some real high performers and being, being fortunate to be around a lot of people who really operate at the edge of their capabilities, I kind of def came up with my own definition of a champion. A champion is someone who is pushing the limits of their human potential. And it doesn't have to be physical. It could be emotional. It could be psychological. It could be someone who, at the end of the day, knows that they've gotten pretty much the most that they can out of the time that they've spent. I don't think anybody ever truly gets there, but some people get really close. And I'd like to talk about one right now, if you'll indulge me for a minute. Does anyone here listen to classical music? Oh. Got to raise more hands. Okay. You've heard of Beethoven, right? Ludwig von Beethoven. Everybody's heard of him, whether you listen to it or not. He's a champion, and I'm going to tell you why. May 7th, 1824, in Vienna, one of the biggest cultural events probably in history took place. Everybody was excited about it. It occurred in a hall probably three or four times bigger than this. Uh, it was a very big event, and people were looking forward to it because it was going to be the world premiere of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Beethoven wrote nine symphonies. Each one really was a landmark in itself, but by the time he was at the end of his career, Beethoven was the rock star of music, as people knew it, certainly in Europe. And he also was a recluse. He was really a, a kind of a personality that people wanted to know more about. He did crazy things like throw food at waiters in restaurants, and he had these love affairs, and he had a lot of, of drama went around Beethoven. But he had been out of the scene for 12 years. He had not been seen publicly for 12 years. But the word was out he was going to be at the premiere of the Ninth Symphony. So the crowd came in. There's the largest orchestra ever assembled, a chorus of 300 people. And Beethoven is there. And everybody's like, man, what's this guy going to do? Because they don't ever you know, really know. He sits in front of the conductor. He doesn't conduct, but he sits in a chair in front of the conductor with the score, which is the, you know, the music. And the orchestra begins. And they start going through it. And Beethoven's beating time and going through the score as they go. Anyway, it's a fairly long piece. At the end of the fourth movement, which is the chorus and orchestra uh, together, uh, the chorus is singing the words to Schiller's Ode to Joy, which is about these very sweeping themes about brotherhood and hu you know, humanity and equality, a lot of the things that we like. But they're going through this big piece, and it's very dramatic, and they get to the end, and the crowd goes wild. I've never heard anything like it. And I don't know, if, you know what the greatest pieces of music ever written are, but... The Beethoven's Ninth is in the, is in the list. It's in the top five, right? Well, an unusual thing happened. Right after the piece was done, crowds on their feet cheering, Beethoven still sitting in his chair, 
conducting and looking at his score. What? The contralto goes over and taps him on the shoulder, stands up. She turns him around. 3,000 people are jumping up and down, screaming. And then the crowd realizes he hadn't heard any of it. He hadn't heard the applause. He hadn't heard the music. Beethoven was deaf. What level of problem solving does that take to write one of the greatest pieces of music ever written without ever hearing it? That's why he hadn't been in public. He'd been deaf for about 10 years. So whenever I'm frustrated or I think that things aren't going well or I need to do something better, I listen to some Beethoven, and that lets me know that I haven't scratched the surface of what is possible. You know? You don't even know what's possible. That's what a champion is. That's somebody who takes their God-given talents. They don't give up. They keep going towards their goals no matter what. Champions have a dream, okay, a vision. I use the word dream, and I know that's almost cliche, but they have a dream that ignites their whole process, right? I call it the dream goal. That is something that gets you out of bed in the morning. I don't know that anybody wants to get out of bed at 5 a.m. and go jump into a cold swimming pool so that they can swim the third 50 of a 200 butterfly in 28.5 seconds. That's definitely part of being an Olympic champion, but that's not enough. There has to be more. You know, I sat in a room one time with this guy, and uh, he had been relatively successful at an Olympic Games, and his goal had always been to win one gold medal, and he went and he won six. And the next Olympics came up, and we were having this meeting, and we were trying to decide, okay, what do you want this story to be? Because we could walk back the expectations of what you need to do, and you can keep saying, I want to win one more gold medal, or we can go another way. And Michael Phelps sat in the room with me, his mother, his agent, and with the conviction <laughs> that I have never seen anybody have before, said, I want to be the best ever. And that became our mission. And to be the best ever in swimming or in the Olympics, somebody had to win eight gold medals. It had already been done seven. And I think somebody figured that in the Beijing Olympic Games in 2008, the odds of winning an Olympic gold medal were 11 million to one. So we did it eight times. I don't know if that's 88 million to eight or 88 million to one, but you can figure out the math. I'm not a math genius. I'm just a swimming fan. But it was hard to do. And, you know, the reason he got there is because we had this vision and then we put it into action because champions have clearly defined goals and a plan to get there. So once we knew what the dream was, to be the best ever, then we started saying, okay, there are eight events. What are those events? Well, we defined what those were. And in swimming, we have a really great way of kind of keeping track of what we do. It's called times. So you know the times in your events. So we had time goals in every event, right? And the times are what we thought would win. And if they we swam the times and he didn't win, we'd still be happy because that was the goal. The goal was not a piece of metal on a ribbon. The goal was to swim at a certain level that we thought was better than anyone could swim. And that's what champions do. They have a plan. It's clear. There's a time frame. There's a long-term goal out there, three or four years maybe, maybe 10 years. Then you work yourself back. And as you come back, the, the plans become more specific. No one can predict what's going to happen in three years, but you can kind of have a direction, right? Then you work yourself back. Maybe a year away, you can plan pretty specifically. And then you keep working back from there. In six months, where should we be? And then you keep coming back and coming back. And finally, you get to the most important plan of all, the most important goal, and that is the immediate goal. What am I going to do right now? You know? If you have a goal and, you know, you want to make it happen, you got to realize that it is a thousand small decisions made day after day after day after hour after hour that get you there. 
It's not just some burst of inspiration, although that helps at the right moment. You know, when Michael was 12, I decided that, uh, you know, this kid was pretty good. <laughs> and maybe I'd like for him to, to do a formal goal setting exercise. So there was a day where he was out of school, and I called his mother, and I said, would it be okay if I picked Michael up and took him to lunch? And she said yes. And he was absolutely terrified because at that time we, he didn't really know me very well, and we never spent any time together, really, just the two of us. So we sat in this chicken wing restaurant, his favorite place. <laughs> and after he ate about three dozen wings, <laughs> he was 12, I pulled out this sheet of paper. And I said, okay, Michael, what is your dream goal? What would you want to do as a swimmer? He said, well, I want to swim in the Olympics. I was like, okay, cool, good. What do you want to do in the next year? He said, I want to make the junior nationals. He already had a kind of sense for it. I said, well, what events do you want to make it in? He's like, I don't know. So I said, okay, well, how about 1,500 meters? <laughs> That's the longest one. He said, okay. And then I said, well, what's your best event now? He said, 200 fly. I said, okay, we'll put that in there. And then the one that I wanted, I was like, how about 400 IM? He said, okay. So we put those down. And for each of those events, I made him come up with three things that were very specific that if he did them in practice, it would end up, he would go the time that he wanted to go. And he did that fairly easily. And so I just gave him this paper, and I said, I want you to put this somewhere where you can see it a lot. And then I said, just put it on the refrigerator, right? Because he was eating nonstop those days. So he saw it, you know, 30 times a day. This was in uh, February, I think. And the meet that he was talking about was in August. So what happened was we swam through the summer, and he swam in the junior nationals. He qualified, and he made the junior nationals. And he started swimming these times and when we're at the meet I hadn't really thought about it too much but his times were really close to what I knew were on that paper so when we got home I, I said can you please bring that paper in and he did and his time his goal time in the 200 fly was 204.68 and he swam 204.68 and the 400 IM he wanted to go 431 80 two and he went 431.84 as four one hundredths of a second so it's like the same time right basically and then in the 1500 meters which lasts 16 minutes his goal was 16 minutes flat he went 16 minutes point eight eight tenths of a second over 16 minutes not too bad and I was like man maybe there's something to this goal setting stuff right <laughs> it's pretty specific and he's proven over and over that that's true a year before the Olympic Games, now we don't even have to do that. He just gives me a sheet of paper with his goals on it so that I know, and then we can work on it. A year before the Beijing Olympics and the 100 free, he gave me a sheet of paper that said I want to swim 47.51. He let off the relay in 47.51 a year later. It's very powerful. And the more specific you make your goal setting and the more clearly defined your time frame, the better it will be. And it's not just Michael that does this. I've had dozens of athletes do it. So I encourage you to look seriously into that process. Champions welcome challenges as a means to grow. Um, a few decades back now, there's this guy named Earl Nightingale. You might have read some of his stuff. He did a survey of all the success literature. Okay? You know, there's, there's all this stuff coming about how to be successful, all this self-help stuff, and he started reading all of it. And he wanted to know what was common among all those. And he only found one thing. One thing. Successful people make a habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. So when I say that champions like challenges, a lot of the stuff that goes into these performances you see every four years is incredibly boring tiring, difficult, tedious, and absolutely necessary. That's 90% of what you do. So I think you lose a lot of people along the way because they think that when I have this dream and it charges me up so much, this whole thing's just going to be everyday inspiration. That's not true at all. It's everyday perspiration. You're going to go in there and work, and you're going to work, and you're going to be frustrated, and you're going to keep working, you're going to be frustrated, and every now and then you'll get a little glimpse of what might happen. 
And on most days, there's something you can point to that went well. But some days, you can't. And I think that's a big key, to be able to mentally handle that and to mentally know that. And I'm not sure we're teaching kids that these days. That's why I love sports. That's why I love swimming, because I think it's so valuable. I think now everybody wants something today. They want immediate gratification. Swimming is all about delayed gratification. And I think that that <laughs> is an important concept in every field. You know, we talked about problem solving. <laughs> Beethoven cut the legs off his pianoforte and put it on the floor so that he could lay on the floor and put his ear on it and barely hear the vibrations. So he had some sense of what was going on sound-wise. All great performers have to overcome problems. You know, you see Michael Phelps or anybody who performs at a high level, well, they're just talented, right? They have this seven-foot wingspan, flexible ankles, some heart that's three times the size of everybody else. I don't know about that one. But I know that during this process, Michael Phelps went for six years without ever missing a day of training, 365 days a year. And I know that because I was there <laughs> Christmas morning, you know, <laughs> New Year's, Thanksgiving, you name it. We always swam. And it wasn't something that he was made to do. It's something he made me do. <laughs> I would have been happy not to do it. He insisted on it because he wanted to be the best ever. And while you don't have to go to that level, you got to go to some level if you want to really break out. along with all that tedious stuff, comes a lot of failure, you know? And I think today people protect their kids from failure. They don't want them to feel bad. They don't want them to hurt. They don't want them to do that, right? And it's a huge mistake because failure is where you learn the most. That's what makes you great. When you try something at the edge of your capabilities and you don't get there, then you have to sit back and say, okay, what could I have done better? How can I do something that's going to help me gain the capabilities to move past that barrier. What am I doing that's not working, right? And uh, that's where you get the most out of it. If you protect your kids from failure all the time, they're never going to learn. And they're always going to be afraid. So champions are very good at handling failure, and that's how you learn to succeed, by learning how to handle failure. Champions produce predictable and normal results in abnormal and unpredictable environments. That's the essence of Olympic competition. So this summer when you see the Olympics in Rio, and trust me, there's going to be enough crazy in Rio for all the Olympics we've ever had. They're all different, right? And they all have some challenges. You know, in China, it was the smog. In uh, Athens, the pool would not have a roof. It would be so hot, nobody could possibly swim. Well, in both cases, everybody went and swam, and things went okay. But... The people who succeeded were the ones who were prepared to deal with things that were unpredictable and could adapt to situations. You hear a lot about mental toughness, right? Mentally tough. And I think in terms of mental pliability. I don't want my athletes to be mentally tough. Mentally tough people break down under pressure. <laughs> mentally pliable people learn to adapt quickly. They have flexibility. They have the ability to concentrate on what they're doing when things around them don't go as maybe they had seen it coming. And that's really, really important. You know, people ask me, what's, what's it like to swim in the Olympic Games? Anybody golf here? Surely in Arizona. Anybody golf well? I'll put my hand down. Imagine yourself doing a three-foot putt. I'll bet if you were by yourself, you know, either in your office with one of those fake things or out on a putting green by yourself, nobody around, three-foot putt, you could get pretty good at it, right? You could do a three-foot putt like that. And I know the greens are different, but in general, you're that close, probably hit it. Now imagine yourself with all your friends and family watching you do the three-foot putt. Yeah, probably still do it. How about if you were doing that three-foot putt tomorrow afternoon on the 18th green at Augusta to win? Same putt, way different environment. 
what if you're at Augusta tomorrow doing your three-foot putt and to win the tournament in a hailstorm? That's kind of what the Olympics are like. Everybody can swim a 200 IM because they've been doing it since they were 10. But can you do it in an environment where you know a billion people are watching you and basically this is your one chance? The thing I love about the Olympic Games is there's really a time there where the rubber meets the road. When you send an athlete out to swim in the Olympic Games, there is no tomorrow. The next chance is four years away. And most people only get one ever in their life. So you want to make it good. And the way that you make it good is to be as prepared as you can possibly be and to be able to handle these circumstances as they come up. And the way you do that is by rehearsing it as you go. Champions rehearse success on a daily basis, either physically or emotionally or psychologically. I tell my athletes, I've got to see some part of your race every day. Not the whole thing, but maybe a stroke pattern, maybe a turn. Maybe you need to practice visualization to rehearse mentally. Does anybody here visualize? It's very important. It's a critical skill. You know why? <laughs> Here's why. Everyone has a very strongly held belief of who you are and what you're about, right? Your ego. <laughs> I don't get too Freudian, but that's it, right? And you have a vested interest in keeping that the way it is, so you know who you are, right? And you have all of these beliefs that you've built up over your life, and you have all of these circumstances, and you have all of your parents and friends and everybody else telling you kind of who you are, so you know who that is. When you set a goal, you're basically creating a picture of yourself in a different way. It's a different you. The, the, the picture of you as Olympic champion is different than you as the starting out swimmer who just won a state high school meet. Very different. And what happens is your subconscious and your conscious will move to the mental picture that is strongest. So if your picture is, I'm not all that good, but I'm a pretty good swimmer, that's the way you're going to be. If your picture is, I'm the Olympic champion, I will do whatever it takes to get there, I will think about it all the time, I will visualize myself doing it, I will see myself doing it, that's where things start to move. Visualization is key in any sort of goal-oriented activity. The best person in the world at vis visualization, I promise, is Michael Phelps, in any sport, in anything, and I can tell you why. Michael came to me, you know, before the Beijing Olympics, and he's always been good at visualization. I've encouraged him to do it. I taught him how to do it in a little thing. And he runs constant videos in his heads of his races, and he'll run them like he's sitting in the stands watching himself swim. He'll watch it like he's, he'll, he'll see a, vid, uh, a visualization like he's swimming, what it looks like while he's swimming. And then he'll visualize what happens if, I, if something goes wrong in my race. What if somebody swims differently than I think they will? What if I don't go out as quickly as I want? How will I overcome those things? So he visualizes all of that, and he programs himself so that when he gets up to race, he doesn't have to think about it. He's just got this bank of visualization. He came to me, and he said, I'm having this recurring dream. I was like, do I want to know what it is? You know? <laughs> I didn't say champions were perfect, right? He said they operate at the edge of their capabilities. And he said, I keep swimming, and I look up at the scoreboard, and I see 3.07 time, three minutes, seven seconds. Well, if any of you know anything about swimming, that is not any swimming event time. We don't do 300s. 3.07 is not a time. And at the time, we were kind of getting close to Beijing, and the pressure was kind of mounting on everybody. And, you know, sometimes as a coach, I just try to say something because I feel like I, I'll look like an idiot if I just say, okay. So <laughs> and then I usually say something and prove that I'm an idiot, but it's okay. In this case, I said, well, it's probably your 300 split in the 400 IM. Because if you want to swim 403, you're probably going to be out at 307. Plausible. I can tell you that the hair stood up on my neck when I looked at the scoreboard in Beijing and the final at the 300 mark, and it said 307 flat. It stands up right now. I got goosebumps thinking about it. 
I don't think it's superhuman. I think it's somebody who has taken something to a level and gone beyond. And I think it's something we can all do. We can all visualize. And if we wanted to spend the time on it, you could get those kind of results. You know, Michael wasn't dropped here from Mars. He's a human. He is more human than anybody in this room, I promise you, in many, many ways. So something to think about. Finally, champions value the process more than any particular outcome. What does that mean? It means that when you're in competition with other athletes, other companies, whatever it is, right, other people for jobs, you can't control what the other people do. There are a lot of variables that you cannot control. So don't spend any time worrying about that. You know, a gold medal is something that's largely controlled by other people. <laughs> who swims slower than you or who swims faster, right? You know, you, can't, you can only control how you swim, how you practice, your standard of practice, your standard of what you will accept from yourself. Those are the things that we focus on. I follow American football, and there's a famous college coach named Nick Saban, and he's all about the process too. And his famous saying is, don't look at the scoreboard, play the next play. That's the essence of what we're doing here. A lot of people get sidetracked in their pursuit of whatever they're doing because they start thinking about what might happen. You know, there's only so much time left. What will happen if I don't do this? How about if you just focused on accomplishing what you set out in your plan? Another famous football coach, uh, Urban Meyer, right? If you ever heard him mic'd up on the sideline, he says this all the time. Four to six seconds of relentless focus and energy. Four to six seconds. That's all you need. You don't have to worry about the other 60 minutes, the other 59 minutes and, you know, 54 seconds. Just six seconds. And if you do that and you're engaged in the moment, the other stuff takes care of itself. So that's what champions do. They focus on the things they can control, they have a plan, and they work on every day making it a little bit closer to the plan. One step, one step, one step, right? I'll close with one other Michael story because people like these, but I know. <laughs> I have other kids too. I actually coach some other people. Some of them are sitting in here. Um, Kind of goes with the step thing. Uh, Michael had his breakout swim. You know, I told you he went that 204.68 in the 200 fly. He was 14 years old. That was in August. He went to the Nationals in 2000 in March. So the Olympics were coming up, and we had not even thought about it, right? He's just this punk kid, right? Pretty good, but, you know, not that good. So the record, when he went to 204.68, he broke by 1-100, the national age group record for 14-year-olds that had stood for 20 years. So it was a significant record, and he broke it by about that much. Yeah, good job. Okay. He came back in the spring nationals, and in the prelims of the nationals in the 200 fly, he swam 159.6. That broke the record for the 15, 16-year-olds. He was still 14. You know, that was like a Bob Beeman leap in swimming, okay? And that night he came back, and he got third, actually, and he swam 159 flat. And I remember walking out of the pool that day, and I'm like, this kid's going to make the Olympic team. It had never dawned on me till then. And at that point, it was like, okay, you better get yourself ready. Well, anyway, we went home, and uh, we got home from the airport, and I went and dropped Michael off at his house. And his mother had decorated the entire yard and the house in red, white, and blue flags, stars, stripes, whatever. Congratulations, Michael. Yeah. So I parked the car, got out, took all of it down. She wasn't home. <laughs> and I left him. And, you know, Debbie called in, and she, and, and she was irate. She's like, what are you doing? I was like, what are you doing? She's like, you know. I'm just celebrating my son. I'm like, Debbie, we are at step 100 of 10,000 steps. What are you going to do when he gets to step 300? Buy him a car? You know? 
it's the process that's the most valuable. It's the things he's learning. And, you know, I did let her put a sign on his door for one week after every good meet. Congratulations, Michael. Nice. That was great. Okay? It's kind of <laughs> proportional. And he got plenty of, <laughs> you know, rewards down the road. But I think that the key is if you look at things in perspective and you find your dream, you can accomplish some amazing things. Whether it is teaching a generation of children to love food and changing the world doing it that way, or whether it's by Olympic competition, or whether it's by being a great farmer. The process is all the same. And I hope that all of you will find your dream and get to work. Thank you very much.